Today's webinar will be presented by Angie White, our product marketing manager here at iOvation. Let's begin. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you to everybody for joining us today. I know this is a very busy time of year for e-commerce, so definitely appreciate everybody taking the time out of your day. Um, this is a, a subject that you know I find uh, very interesting and definitely um, there's a lot of activity in the market. So I'm excited to be able to talk to you about it here today. First off, I, uh, let's make sure we just kind of level set with a definition of account takeover or ATO. So account takeover is when a known good customer's account is breached for the purposes of committing fraud. Um, account taker, takeover is not a new phenomenon, um, but it is something that we have seen rising in recent years. Uh, this is something that Iovation has helped our customers combat for years, um, especially in like online banking, credit issuance, even, even on gaming sites. So this is something that we've seen a lot of. Um, but what is new is the dramatic increase that we've seen in ATO in e-commerce in the last few years. So we actually did an analysis. We were hearing from a number of our uh, e-commerce customers that this was a growing problem for them. So we looked at our confirmed fraud reports for account takeover in e-commerce from August 2017 to August 2018. And in that period, we saw a 220% increase. So um, definitely pretty dramatic. So, so we started looking into this and um, we really, you know, wondering for all of you, how how big of a problem is ATO in your organization? So if everybody could take a quick minute and um, respond to our little poll here, uh, wondering, you know, if, is this not a problem at all in your business? Um, is it a small problem, but you're still, you're, you're seeing a rise? Um, is it an increasing problem or is it definitely a large problem in your organization? So I'll give everybody just a few seconds here to respond to our poll. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and scroll here for it and we'll see the, our, our results. Um, so it looks like it definitely is um, a problem or a rising problem for a lot of organizations. So that jives with what we've been hearing from our customers. So why the big increase? Um, to begin with, you really gotta, gotta look at the, the, the landscape of the market. So you're seeing that you know, retailers in response to customer expectations, they're launching uh, dedicated accounts. So moving away from guest checkout. Um, and they're also launching um, dedicated apps so that people can um, get in, have that, that better customer experience and more quickly check out. Uh, what this does though, is it also opens the door for fraudsters. Um, this was a recent report um, where they found that retailers who have both a mobile site and a dedicated app are seeing on average two thirds of their tra transactions come from mobile. So 44% are in app and then 23% from mobile with the remaining 33% from desktop. The interesting part to this I, I found was that the conversion rates are three times higher for mobile apps than mobile web. Um, to me, this really shows that, you know, that focus on customer experience, being able to give that differentiated customer experience um, and an easier um, shopping experience has uh, definite benefits within e-commerce. Um, but as I said, this also opened the door for, for uh, fraudsters because before there was no account to take over. So let's look at what are some of the impacts of this change. Well, first off, fraud isn't just a business problem. It's a customer experience problem. So last year we saw that the cost of ATO uh, in the US reached 5.1 billion. Um, so that's across all industries. Um, it's definitely been a prevalent problem in online banking and some other industries and we're starting to see that growth in e-commerce. Um, I think one of the more interesting stats here is that false declines are valued at 118 billion per year. So those are customer insults. Those are customers that were turned away because um, they were suspected of fraud and it ended up that they weren't. 
So that's a, that's a big problem for businesses. And that's a big problem for customers um, who are then, you know, had a bad experience with your site while trying to transact. And then there's also a more direct impact for uh, consumers, especially with account takeover. So on average, a consumer spends 16 hours resolving issues uh, after their account is taken over. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have an extra 16 hours <laughs> to spend on something like this. Um, so, you know, that creates a lot of ill will, that creates um, a lot of negativity, and that has big impacts on um, the overall customer relationship and your brand reputation. So let's look at, you know, what are some of the methods that um, are used for account takeover? Um, first, I'll, I'll call out that data breaches are up 45% in 2017. And the reason I call that out is because it um, is fueling a lot of these other attack methods that you're seeing. So credential stuffing is one of the, the biggest methods that we see, and that's where basically fraudsters, they go out, they purchase a big list of login credentials and passwords, and then they, they spray your site with those to see which ones will work. Um, social engineering, this is um, where fraudsters go out and they collect information that's publicly available about, about you, usually through social media sites. Um, and then they use this to target customers. They, they might directly target them um, to get them to give access to their account, or they might use that information to target your call center where they will, will post as the good customer and um, get you to, to either give access to the account or in the next example we see here, SIM swapping. So they might call and try to get you to swap the SIM from the customer's account to theirs, and that allows them to intercept SMS messages, one-time password, other methods that you might be using to secure the customer's account. Uh, malware, bots, spyware. I think the interesting thing there is that you're really seeing an automation side to what some of these fraudsters are doing. Um, you know, this isn't some guy alone sitting in his basement. You know, these are sophisticated fraud rings that are working together um, to perpetrate crime. Uh, and then phishing attacks. I think we've all been uh, receivers of emails that, you know, look like they're coming from the IRS or a legitimate company that um, ask a consumer to take an action, such as click link, something along those lines. Looking at some of the impacts of ATO, so, you know, there's some of the obvious ones, such as uh, cost of lost goods and chargebacks. Uh, we talked about damage to customer relationships, you know, um, again, with, you know, the average customer taking 16 hours to uh, fix issues from ATO um, that can have long lasting damage to a customer relationship. Loss of brand reputation. Um, I think, you know, the old stat was that uh, customers, if they're happy with a, a brand experience, they tell two people. If they're unhappy, they tell 10. Well, now we have uh, Twitter and Facebook and all these social platforms where, you know, those types of issues can really be magnified um, so that they can tell a lot more people a lot more quickly. And then the other thing I wanted to point out, too, that um, a lot of people might not think about is regu regulatory noncompliance. So, a lot of the new regulations, such as GDPR, PSD2, and then in the U.S., there's been new privacy regulations in New York, California. You know, this is becoming a, a bigger and bigger uh, issue and more top of mind um, on how do we protect customers' data. And, um, you know, we're starting to see more regulations that are making that um, uh, a, a mandate for businesses. Um, so this was... a uh, uh, a graph where uh, we, this comes from the FTC, where they were looking at data breaches um, since 2003 correlated with the number of consumer complaints. And as you can see, there's a direct correlation. So as the number of data breaches have um, increased, we've also seen a direct correlation in complaints for ID theft and fraud. Um, the reason I call this out is because I don't, I don't think you're going to see this trend slow down any. We're still seeing breaches we're still seeing um, breached credentials and login credentials, personal data. Um, so really, I think what this shows us is that 
there needs to be a shift in thinking, a shift in the way that we protect customers' accounts and the way that we protect customers' data. So if everybody could take a quick moment, we have another poll here for you, very exciting. Um, so what is your top concern in implementing a solution to combat ATO? Um, are you concerned about adding customer friction, um, increasing security for your customer accounts, finding a solution that's compatible with your existing infrastructure, or maybe increasing your overall fraud catch? All right, I'll give people just a few more seconds here. Okay, so it looks like not adding customer friction was number one there. Um, but obviously there's some other concerns here around like security, reducing overall fraud. So we'll talk about that, how to strike that balance. First, let's look at, you know, what are some of the symptoms of um, an ATO attack? So, you know, some of the things that we commonly see are, you know, use of VPN or proxy servers. This is basically, um, you know, a fraudster is trying to mask where they're really coming from or what device they're using. Um, using an older browser or operating system, uh, geolocation mismatches. Um, this is, you know, where you might see uh, a device. They're trying to say that they're sitting in Portland, Oregon, where I am. Um, but we can really see based on their IP address or geolocation information that they're in Russia. So obviously that's a risk indicator. Uh, high velocity of login attempts from one device. You know, if you see one device trying to access a thousand accounts, that's not a normal consumer behavior. Um, so that's a risky uh, factor that you should probably look into. Uh, a changing account details such as ship to address. Again, another method that uh, fraudsters use to try to take over accounts going in, uh, access, accessing the account, and then changing account details. So all areas where we can look for risk, uh, areas where we can look for a possible attack. So we, we uh, talk to one customer. This was actually a gaming site, and it's an interesting case study. So um, they were launching a new game, and what they found um, was there was one device that they found was associated with 2,500 accounts. So again, not a, not a normal consumer behavior. Um, and luckily, they were able to catch this before um, they were were able to infiltrate and take over those accounts. Um, but really just kind of, we wanted to look through, think through what would be the potential losses from an attack of this sort. So those accounts, they amounted to about $50,000 in revenue per month. Um, so that's, you know, potential lost revenue if those customers left. It would have taken 5,000 man hours to repair each of those accounts. So they were estimating two hours per account to get it back to a normal state if it was taken over. Um, and I would call it too the cost of those man hours. Um, if you're saying it's uh, 5,000 man hours, you're paying um, a minimum of $15 an hour, that'd be $75,000 for the cost of that labor. Uh, potentially $5,000 in chargebacks. And then two, the, the cost of the, the brand reputation. So what's the solution? Well, I think there's always going to be, you're going to have to be looking at your own business. What are your competing needs? Um, you know, on the customer experience side, um, application owners, um, they're going to be worried about, you know, reducing overall friction, creating that optimized customer experience, reducing card abandonments and growing revenue. Um, you know, those are all needs for the business. And then on the, the flip side, you know, you have um, the fraud and security team that's reduced about are, are concerned about reducing your overall attack surface, um, creating a higher level of assurance for ID and access, um, leveraging existing capabilities and infrastructure. So not wanting to have to go in and rip and replace um, your authentication system. And then looking at real-time threats and risk indicators. So, you know, what are those early indicators that you can catch to keep your, your customers 
secure, and prevent account takeover to begin with. And, you know, I find that this is especially tricky in the e-commerce space. Um, you know, with, in working with um, our customers over the years, you know, we, we hear that there's a very high awareness of adding any type of friction. Um, and I, I find this an interesting stat that 28% of carts were abandoned because of a checkout process that was too long or complicated. Um, you know, it just really shows that, you know, customers are very um, sensitive to any added friction. I think we've all been there, you know, gone through a too complicated login process where we had to reset our password and get, you know, uh, uh, an SMS text where we type in little numbers on our phone. Um, and then we just abandon that purchase because it's, it's too much hassle. So this was a study done by WordPress and what they were looking at was the average conversion rates for an e-commerce site. So what they found was, um, on the median, you had about, about 2.35% conversion rate. Uh, when you looked at the top 25%, that conversion rate almost doubled to 5.31%. And then at looking at the top 10%, that conversion rate doubled again, 11.45%. Um, so, you know, to me, what this is saying, this is really kind of painting this picture of, you know, the, the top performing e-commerce sites are the ones that are really looking at that um, user friction, optimizing the experience, getting to that one-click uh, shopping experience. So how can you do that and keep your, your site secure? Um, again, this one's kind of looking at that, that, that kind of same rationale where you're looking at the gap between um, your average site and top 20. Um, this is looking at the average time on site or, or average number of visits per month. And as you can see, it, um, you know, the top performing sites, uh, they're, they're having customers uh, convert. They're having customers come back and spend time on their site. So, you know, how can you, how do we strike that balance? So really in a well-designed system, you can incorporate uh, risk signals to tailor the level of authentication to the riskiness of the transaction. So you're not treating all customer all customers like they're a criminal and you're not treating all criminals like they're a customer. You're striking that balance uh, so that you can look at risk signals and use the appropriate level of, of authentication. Um, so an example of this might be, you know, a customer just wanting to log in and look at a previous order. That's probably not a very risky transaction. So you might want to use the most lightweight authentication. Whereas, um, you know, a new customer from an unknown device wanting to make a $5,000 purchase, uh, that might require a higher level of authentication, a higher level of assurance. But why would you treat both of those transactions the same? So on the, the lowest friction, the lowest, uh, lightest footprint, we have uh, device-based authentication. So with this, what you do is the customer, they come in, uh, they go to access your site, using their device. And this could be anything from a smartphone to a tablet, laptop, um, whatever device they want to use. And think of that little like check mark you see underneath uh, username and password, um, remember my device. So basically, this is what they're doing. They're saying, yes, I want you to remember this device. And then it pairs the account to the device. Um, but in the background, you're getting all this risk evaluation that's happening. Um, we're looking at the device and we're lo looking for any of those risk signals that we talked about earlier. We're looking for geolocation mismatch. We're looking for um, high velocities. We're looking for um, any types of uh, recognition evasion. Uh, if you don't see any of those risk factors and yes, this is a good match device, then you can grant access easily get them through and get them shopping. If you don't see a match or you see risk signals, um, then you can step up to another mode of authentication. After you authenticate the customer, you can allow them to then go through the same process, register that new device and check for any risk signals and grant them access. 
So that all happens then after the customer has registered the, that device, each time they return, uh, those risk checks are done in the background, all transparent, completely frictionless, completely um, uh, very easy for customers. So uh, wanted to look at this in relation to ATO. So we actually, one of our uh, really large telco customers, they were having a big problem with account takeover. So what was happening is um, through social engineering, fraudsters were going to dating sites, ingratiating themselves with um, customers and gaining access to their accounts. Um, so they were basically getting them to give them their um, username and passwords. Then what they would do is once they had access to the account, they would add a bunch of lines of service, order phones, and then uh, abscond with that hardware. So this was, you know, costing them thousands and lost merchandise. Um, they had the cost of chargebacks, lost revenue from service cancellations, and they also had some pretty unhappy customers. You know, even though they were at fault, customers don't usually see it that way, right? Um, their first attempt at um, solving the problem, they they implemented an authentication solution um, that was too onerous. So it required um, uh, it required a lot of inputs from the the customers, and it resulted in um, an increase in call center volume and an increase in complaints from their customers. So the customers were not happy with the mode of authentication that they had implemented there. So what they did is they uh, implemented device-based authentication. Um, and as a result, they uh, stopped account takeover at login. Um, they improved their, their login experience for customers. So um, that resulted in a, a reduced uh, volume to their call center, uh, reduced volume of password resets, um, and increased su customer satisfaction. So. This was one of those rare, rare win-wins where they were able to stop account takeover while, off, while also improving that customer experience. Um, if you guys, I think we have this as a handout. So um, if you guys are interested in, in, in learning more about this case study, um, we, we actually have a full case study that we did on this. I just kind of pulled out some of the pertinent details. Um, we'll send that as a follow-up or I think you can grab it as a handout. So what are some of the benefits of device-based authentication? Uh, one, that it's transparent and frictionless. So, you know, it really simplifies that access for your good users, um, lowers those bar barriers to usage, um, allowing you to improve customer experience. Um, it's also giving you that context and risk insight that a lot of authentication systems lack. Um, it's able to understand the context around the device, looks, look for risk indicators before you know, account takeover can happen um, and detect, you know, attempts to evade or mask identity. Um, it's also highly adaptive and dynamic. So you can, you know, use this to react to your changing uh, risk profile um, to deliver the right level of assurance um, and minimize unneeded uh, step ups so that you can really use this to um, streamline your authentication process. Um, and the great thing is that this can also be layered on top of your existing um, authentication. If you do need to step up to a higher level of authentication, there's um, our mobile multi-factor authentication. Um, you know, basically this re with this, you can completely replace uh, passwords. So instead of, you know, having customers remember a password that's eight to 25 characters long, has a number, a capital letter, a special character, a partridge in a pear tree. Just kidding on that last one. Um, you can allow them to authenticate using, um, say their thumbprint, a pin code, uh, something we just launched recently is facial, uh, facial recognition, um, all these different authentication methods, um, a simple swipe with their thumb, so basically any type of authentication that um, is supported through a smart device um, can be supported through launch key. Um, the great thing about this is that there's also authorization capability. So you can authenticate through launch key, but you can also, also use authorization. So in real-time authorization, 
Um, there's a number, number of benefits and number of use cases where this can be really handy. Um, you know, we find that, you know, fraud is generally targeted at higher value value items on uh, e-commerce sites. Um, so you could set it up so that authorization is required for any purchases over, say, $500. Um, that whatever threshold that you find where, you know, uh, fraud is perpetrated at higher, higher, higher levels. Um, you could also set this up so that uh, for packages, if a package is left um, at a customer's house without a signature, you could send an a authorization request straight to their phone, um, having them authorize that, yes, um, this package can be left without my signature. So that gives you that audit trail, also helps you in cutting down friendly fraud. I know we're talking about ATO, but friendly fraud is also a problem. Um, and then the other capability here is multi-party uh, authorization. So this could be really useful too if you're looking at, say, a corporate account um, where, you know, maybe somebody's attempting account takeover and they want to go in and add a new ship to address. Um, you could send out that authorization uh, request to two of three approvers. So a number of use cases there. Um, the other uh, key benefit here too is that this can be used both for online and offline workflows. So it can be used to secure your um, your web portal. It can be used to secure your application. It can also be used uh, in the call center. So say somebody calls into the call center, they're trying to change the ship to address or trying to access an account. Um, you can have the call rep send um, an authentication request directly to the user's phone. They authenticate with their thumbprint and then uh, they're, they're able to be authenticated before they proceed with the call. Some of the benefits of MF, uh, MFA, uh, unifying that customer experience, uh, reducing friction from having multiple uh, logins, uh, securing the, the customer journey, so removing that credential store. I think that's a big one, especially with um, you know some of the changes with uh, regulations such as GDPR, which are making um, such breaches much more costly for businesses. Um, with decentralized credentials, um, all the credentials are stored on the user's phone, so you don't have that big target um, database with all that user information that you have to worry about securing. Um, and then customizable for any app. So this is something where you can it's completely white labeled. You can integrate it in, within your own application, allowing you to keep that brand equity that you've built. Um, it's also very customizable. So you can either um, choose which uh, authentication methods you wanna allow users to use, or you can leave that choice to uh, customers. And that also gives them a lot more buy into the process if um, they're able to select the authentication method they want to use. So in summary, um, you know, just just some advice on combating ATO. Um, really, you need to think about recognizing um, and assessing risk um, that are unseen. I, I, I mean, we talked about the number of breaches that have happened um, over the last decade. I think everybody's aware of that. Um, I think we need to move forward with the assumption that, you know, credentials and personal data has most likely been breached. So what are some other ways that we can look at um, securing customers' accounts? Uh, working with peers to stop known threats. Um, this is something that um, Iovation, we've worked on for the last 14 years, um, really building up a network of shared fraud intelligence where people can collaborate across industries and geographies to stop known threats. Um, automated screening, so using device as a second fa factor of authentication um, and only stepping up when necessary. Um, so really kind of thinking about that customer experience, um, thinking about the, the buying experience and automating where we can, reducing friction where we can and only stepping up uh, when necessary, based on risk indicators. Um, with that, I think we have some time for a few questions here. I know I'm a little over time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks, Andy, for sharing those insights and findings. Um, as Andy mentioned, we'll be taking some questions from the audience. 
already have a few that have come in. Um, the first one here. With device-based authentication, what do you do if a user's device is lost or stolen? That's a great question. So uh, if a user's device is lost or stolen, they can actually report it to you, and then you can um, go in in the um, admin console and uh, unpair that device. So there is the ability to unpair devices so that you can make sure, especially if it's been stolen, um, that that device is no longer able to access the account. Next question. Does your authentication use any personal data? Uh, great question. So um, that's something, you know, we definitely pride ourselves on is a very minimal use of personal data. So with our uh, device-based authentication, we do use um, IP address, which could be considered personal data under GDPR. Um, but that's about it. And then um, our multi-factor authentication uh, launch key, that's all decentralized, as I said before, all stored on the, the user's uh, device. So completely GDPR friendly, uh, no personal data used there. Next question. How can you protect against ATO attacks aimed at the call center? That's a great question. Um, you know, and we've had a number of our, our customers come back to us with this exact problem. You know, they, they find that they, they start securing um, their site at login. They start securing it at other sites online. And then, you know, fraudsters are very persistent. They then move to the call center. So, you know, as I said before, with um, Launch Key, our, multi, our, our mobile multi-factor authentication, you could use that to secure by sending it, uh, an authentication request directly to the user's device. Um, the other, other way that we've seen um, people combat this is by using um, our fraud prevention. So that's kind of our, our core services, our fraud preventions. Uh, what they'll do is they'll send users back online for a form check or something like that, and that way they can do that device check and get those risk indicators. I think I have time for one last question. Can iOvation layer authentication on top of existing authentication systems, or can you work with existing systems? That's a great question. So um, both our device-based authentication and our multi-factor authentication can work in conjunction um, with other authentication systems or alone. So it's really based on what are your business needs. Thanks, Angie, and thank you all for joining us today for the webinar. As mentioned at the beginning, a link to the on-demand version of this presentation and a link to the slides will be sent out very soon. Please let me know if you have any additional questions. Have a great rest of your day. The webinar has now ended.